The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Apache Geronimo rises to haunt the canyons of Cowboy Punster's dreams. Banking genetic assets and liabilities. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We talk once again to Lois McMaster Bujold about her new book of high fantasy. This is a great one. It's Penrick's Travels, it's called. And Bain publisher Tony Weisskopf joins us in the interview. It's fun discussion of all things Bujold as Lois discusses the book and life and reading and all sorts of great stuff to give you an insight into this wonderful writer. This is part two of our interview with Lois Bujold. We presented the first part on a previous podcast. Plus, we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Now, here's the news. Hey, I want to call particular attention to our May hardcovers and trade paperbacks once more. We have these wonderful books for you. But if you are looking for the print edition, they have been a little difficult to get due to some delays with distribution channels that have been going on, and you can guess why. But that's been resolved, and the books are rolling to the booksellers right now. So if you go to your favorite online retailer, for instance, and see that a May Bain title is temporarily out of stock, don't give up on it, because it's a coming. You might, in the meantime, check out the ebook version, which is absolutely available right now, or you can pre order because I will give you my holy Groover oath that the books are fast on the way to Amazon, BNN.com, all the other distributors and great booksellers out there. And if you don't know what a holy Groover oath is, well, you need to go dig up Dom. So, as a reminder and an exhortation to find some great science fiction and fantasy reading, the May original offerings are. The Shaman of Carries by Eric Flint and Dave Freer. Starship Captain Possert and the Witches of Carries must deal with the slaver culture that makes slaves feel happy to be in chains. And the youngest of the witches, the Lewitt, begins to awaken to her full powers as a healer. Also, a new May hardcover, and we'll talk more with Lois about this, is Penrick's Travels by Lois McMaster Bujold. Footloose nobleman Penrix grows wiser and even more wily as he journeys from young lord to sorcerer and scholar in the Bastard's Order. Oh, and he deals with intrigue and solves mysteries along the way. Three stories of epic fantasy from Sefwa Grandmaster Lois McMaster Bujold. The book includes Penrix's mission, Mira's Last Dance, and The Prisoner of Lemnos. And our May original trade paperback is science fiction novel The Eleventh Gate by Nancy Crest. When war breaks out between the city-states of the eight worlds, the key to victory and peace lies with two unlikely allies. Through the eleventh star jump gate, at the end of which lies a planet of danger and mystery and quantum weirdness, by the way. The eleventh gate by Nancy Cress, Penrick's Travels by Lois McMaster Bujold, and The Shaman of Carries by Eric Flint and Dave Freer are in print on the way or they're already now available as ebooks. Give them some special love if you can, and get some great stories and wonderful characters on the way to entertain you royally. This is part two of a two part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold and Tony Weiskopf discussing Penrick's travels. Part one is available on last week's podcast. Want to welcome Lois McMaster Bujold and hey Tony Weiskopf, uh, publisher of Bain, is also with us here. Hello. Yay! Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. A science fiction legend, Lois McMaster Bujold has won seven Hugo Awards and three Nebula Awards. Her Miles for Kozigan saga is massively popular science fiction mainstay. Um, 
bestsellers that won those Hugos are The Vore Game, Barriar, Mirror Dance. Um, these were in the 90s. Uh, Paladin of Souls also won in, uh, in that's not a Borco, it's a good novel, in 2004, which also won a Nebula. Um, she's yeah, the author of and many other. And the Locus others. Award. Like yes, and the crown. Locus. Yeah. You have several locusts as well. Um, yeah, award. in fact, for novels and novellas, yeah. things yeah. along the way. It's been a long a accumulation. Long, yeah. And uh, most recently, in 2020, um, Lois, you were named the 36th Damon Knight Grand Master by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, um, which is a high honor for that uh, for that organization. I've, I've occasionally remarked that the meaning of any war, award is created by the works that have won them. And so if you look down the list of the 35 prior grandmasters, it's like all oh, people that, you know, are a pretty cool company to be in. That was, that was neat. Out now at Booksellers Everywhere is Penrick's Travels by Louis mm-hmm. McMaster Bujold. The first wife had fertility problems for many, many years, which is why the, the concubine was brought in. And that, that whole story comes up in uh, the third part of... Yeah, that's uh, the prisoner of Lemnos. We get into that mm-hmm. backstory. Uh, because it, that is the, the story of the rescue of Nix's mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so Nikki grew up in a household that was already, you know, more complex than the American nuclear family. <laughs> um, and she was married at a normally young age to a, to a soldier, an officer, uh, one of the Dallas's friends. And it seemed fine, but, uh, but he was killed uh, and left her a widow. Uh, and they had not had kids yet. So... She you know, isn't sure whether it was him or her, or the fact that he was away all the time. Uh, she doesn't know if she's barren, so that's the kind of thing riding in the back of her mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is, you know, should she remarry? She's of an age you know, where women did. Um, but the first marriage, you know, it wasn't, it, the marriage wasn't bad, but the ending of it was disastrous. And you know, She's not in any hurry to get back into that kind of relationship. Um, so, uh, so when, when she meets Penrick, and is quite impressed by him, uh, she's nonetheless, you know, not rushing into romance herself. Uh, so Penrick, uh, does, Penrick will need to court her. Does the fact that she won't jump into bed with him interest Penrick? And in, it seems to really intrigue him because he's kind of used to girls throwing themselves at him. Uh, it's like they hit on him because he's cute and you know looks good and sounds good and sounds smart and all those things and washes his hands. Um, but then they hit Desdemona and and his personality and you know it's just, and he <laughs> described it as, as as like a panicked pony escaping a bog. <laughs> it's just take on how women <laughs> react to him. Uh, like, no, he took on too many issues. This guy is too high maintenance. We will you know we will flee. Sensibly, but uh, but Nikki says made of stronger stuff. You know, with all her army wife background and army widow background, she's been through the mill. It still takes her a bit to get over you know the complexities of Penrick, which is actually brought up into the foreground in the middle story, uh, Mirror's mm-hmm. Last Dance, uh, which is a tale in which one of Penrick's prior uh, one of Desdemona's lives, prior lives, uh, a courtesan named Mira of Adria uh, comes to the fore and uh, deals with the, the particular situation they're in, in, in ways that kind of freak Mickey's out and kind of freak Pen out too, but you know, he's long for the <laughs> ride and he needs some help. Um, so uh, so that, yeah, I, had, I got a chance to play with that. Uh, oh, a whole bunch of things with that story. Well, uh, talk about some of those things because it's uh, you, Penrick uh, dies himself with Henna, uh, and and puts on some high heels and seduces a guy. Um, 
It's just Henrik or is it Mira? Mira is very happily. Is it um, Henrik or Mira? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> spot, in the, spot in the spotlight that you know Henrik is allowing all this to happen, um, because it's the right thing to do. It's getting them out of their you know uh, their situation in which they have been trapped in a in a town you know on the wrong side of the border you know that's lost, giving away with, yeah. the, with the Dallas that, you know people are looking it's, for. It's like he's been. He has taken, in this one, he takes the role of the demons of, of Desdemona in this one and lets her come to the front, sort of. It's not really him, that, and he has he's sort of the advice giver. Yeah, he's, yeah, he could pull a rein on it if he thought it was the best thing to do at any point. Uh, yeah, he could say, stop, no, we're not doing this. And then Desdemona or Mira would get missed and he would have to deal with that. What was so great about Mira that they need her here? Oh, she's she's a very experienced and successful in her day. Uh, basically, Venetian courtesan. If you've read much about them from the, you know, from the heyday, the golden and silver ages of Venice, who had you know had a whole lifestyle that was very interestingly, mm, uh, both within and outside. Uh, uh, the the structures, uh, so uh, so she was that she was that type, you know, that not exactly a rebel, but outside of outside of the standard women's uh, life course thing, um, mm-hmm. and she was successful. You know, she was she was good at what she did. She liked what she did. Uh, she was not downtrodden. She was you know she was good in her day. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so that was you know that was a whole set of personality and experiences that you know nineteen year old Penrick was certainly <laughs> surprised by <laughs> when he acquired them. Uh, but uh, but that was that was fun to give her a chance. And also, I thought Penrick ought to be really good at cross dressing. Just <laughs> on board to you know stage manage it, uh, and that was my chance to explore that idea a little bit. Could you do this, Penrick? Yes, you could. You could do it really well. Well, I mean, yeah. this is this is this is this is a fun idea, but it, 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 these are these are serious serious adventures. The stakes are high for the characters involved, um, mm-hmm. but they're also but they're also handled with such a deft touch that they they are they are light as well. Um, they don't come. I, I think if you gave these situations to any other writers, you would get very very different feeling sorts of stories. Um, mm-hmm. um, and these these are uniquely Bujoldian. <laughs> That 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 you can have these serious things going on, but also very very silly things too, Um, and you know in some ways deeply silly. But you're getting to you're you're getting to explore deeply silly as well as deeply serious. Um, Uh And that 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 is a that that is a fun dance to watch. (laughs) (laughs) It's fun fun to play. Yeah, it's like real life is. Full of both comedy and tragedy at the same time. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, what did Lois in that Clark's World interview? You talked about humor and the use of humor in in your fiction and others. Um, what you, you you didn't like expound to philosophy or anything, but you did say something about it. What what is that? I like humor. I like a certain lightness in what I read. Um, you know, the the drearily, thuddingly. Uh, sermonistic stuff is just you know, on, you know, usually political sermons, but uh, it's just even even when it's a side I'm on, I don't want to be subjected to it um, as a reader and as a writer. I suppose it's you know, it's the way I look at the world, you know, full of absurdity. And, you know, many many horrors are actually full of absurdity, but mm-hmm. um, as we as we see you know, all around, especially if you read much history, which most writers do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I want the humor. I want that you know, in my reading. Uh, so in my writing as well. I noticed a trick with Terry Pratchett's Discworld, mm-hmm. where he really takes on some very weighty themes, but nobody actually ever dies in a Discworld novel. 
because hmm. you have the character of death scene, you know, coming and taking away the people as their as their ghosts or spirits to the afterlife. So, you know, whenever there's whenever there's a major death, we get this little bit of reassurance, you know, that, that the anthropomorphic character of death is taking care of it, and there is, you know, death is really death. So it's a trick that allows him to get away with a lot of stuff that, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to do in a more serious novel. Um, uh. it, it makes comedy out of things that would not normally be comic, um, uh-huh. because, it, because it's got that escape valve. And the world of the five gods does a little of the same thing in that the gods are real. Uh, there is an afterlife. You get glimpses of it. Uh, when things go wrong, you get glimpses of ghosts. Uh, so death is not an ending and a dissolution and a you know entry into the same, same oblivion you came out of. Uh, uh-huh. It is you know, it is not quite so tragic, I guess. Uh, Except for demons, that's a gift. Yeah, that's a yeah. Well, yeah, demons demons do. Uh, if they are taken back by the god, they are rendered down to parts. They are turned into chaos. Everything that was you know, a person about them uh, dissolved. Uh, so demons really don't want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Their death is real. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that, so, that allows a slightly more comic tone in material that you know really wouldn't be for us. Yeah, and and all right. So, and you wouldn't say that the the Last Dance of Mira is is a farce or even it, but it's got a lot of those humorous. Bujoldian elements that that you'll find in um in in say some of the Miles Forkosigan books that are more like social uh, maneuvering books rather than the straight adventures. Uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, that. Oh my God, Patrick, what are you doing? <laughs> Where are you taking us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of what Miles's companions often said. I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, this is fine. But the next novella, uh, The Prisoner of Lemnos, is um, we made a couple of more characters who are very fascinating. I really liked uh, uh, Tanar and Basha in particular. He's extremely competent and he has a really interesting backstory. And he gets to be, he's somebody that that could actually be a problem for Penrick. <laughs> but and Basha's not Bocha. a bad guy, but he could be uh, not if, a bad guy. He's- He's got some dodgy elements. Yeah, he was a character that darn near hijacked the book. Um, <laughs> he had so much life and so much interest. He has a lot of historical precedents, things I had read about, um, went into him. And uh, he's just he's so alive. Uh, but some characters are like that. They hit, they hit the stage running and, you know, and they will gallop off with you in all directions. You, <laughs> Let them. No, no, you're, you're well, a secondary got... character. <laughs> Settle down. Until he, until he gets his own book, yes. <laughs> I, you know, that's one of the possibilities. Of, you know, Another direction I could go off in is to go. But at the time of this story, uh, Sir Kosposh is, is 40. So, you know, a lot of his wilder adventures are, you know, back behind him and, and you would be writing basically. You'd be writing a prequel or a or a backstory story uh, if I did mm-hmm. those, and the front story gets involved with that in places I'm not sure where I want what to do with yet. He has a whole backstory worked out. I should explain for you know readers who are just turning in. It's just like hearing people talk about somebody you haven't met at a party. Um, Sir Kosposha is the eunuch secretary of a character named Lady Tanar who is Adelis's, uh, well, not quite lost love, but uh, certainly parted from sweetheart since he was exiled and she's still back in Sidonia. And uh, she's the one who, who sends the word that Nikis's mother has been arrested and uh, uh, sequestered on in a, basically an island nunnery uh, by the imperial government, and they have to go rescue her, hence the prisoner of Limnos. Limnos is the name of the island. Uh, so, uh, Bosha, Syracos Bosha, is, is of a type uh, that you see in a lot of different literatures in the kind of imperial governments or other places where they had enix. 
Uh, the Chinese mm-hmm. is another one that has a whole literary tradition about them uh, yeah. and historical. Um, and Byzantium, likewise, uh, practiced that quite a bit. Uh, and Rome, uh, ancient Rome, it fell out of favor in the Middle Ages, um, but was actually in ancient times much more, much more practiced. Um, and so reading upon both the Byzantium and the Chinese models of, and in both uh, history and fiction has been fascinating. The admiral who commanded that Chinese fleet that, you know, almost but didn't quite discover Europe uh, mm-hmm. back in the 15th, 14th century, whichever dates that were, uh, he was an eunuch, he was a eunuch type. And there was a interesting tension uh, in the Chinese court uh, between the cadre of Enix who took care of the emperor and also in the, it's identically in the Byzantine court uh, and had kind of the ear and the inner, you know, the inner household and the uh, educated bureaucrats who made up the government, you know, who, which of us should be in charge here. And since the educated bureaucrats are mainly responsible for writing the histories, the Enix don't get very good press, uh, uh, in either uh, either the imperial Byzantine or the imperial Chinese histories, um, mm. but sometimes with good reason. Uh, sometimes it's you know it's pretty clearly you know two groups each struggling for uh, for ascendancy or for power. Um, so that's uh, that was a really interesting compare and contrast. Yeah. So he's of the type, but Circus Bosho is of that Byzantine type, but he's out of it. He was in the government. Um, the emperor he was you know, working for was uh, toppled, as frequently happens. Uh, and mm-hmm. He kind of got caught on the wrong side of the coup and ended up in private service to Lady Tanner uh, at, a, at a fairly early age, his mid-20s, I think. He's been with her ever since. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's the loyal retainer with the interesting backstory. <laughs> well, he has these knives that are all poisoned in various ways, for instance, and he's very good at preparing the poisons. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you can't afford to lose a fight, um, which he wouldn't be, uh, he would be given no quarter uh, in, in any you know, physical fight. You better be sure that uh, you're going to get away. He learned that the hard way in his 20s, too. Still has the scars. Uh, and, so, but yeah, he was a great character. Tanner, basically, the backstory, part of the backstory is that, that he showed up wounded and she nursed him as her sort of imaginary friend in her treehouse for a little while. So he has this huge devotion to her. Yeah, yeah. She was like six and he was like 24, 26, something like that. Yeah. And she kind of, he was so bemused <laughs> and, you know, so dependent. And just, and she was such a personality, you know, that they just fell into this pattern and have been in it ever since to both of their And you you compare it's the you the relationship between Tanner and, and Bosha to uh it, and the fact that if Adelis marries her he's gonna have to, you know, basically marry Bosha too because he's not going anywhere. Um to the way that it would be if um if if Nikus or Nikus um eventually um, get, hooks up and stays with Penrick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the problem of dealing with someone who comes with baggage <laughs> that they're not going to be putting down. Um, uh, Penrick, and, Penrick, and De- Penrick comes with Desdemona, Tanner comes with Bosha. Yeah. So, uh, so that, yeah, that parallel, you know, it's, uh, it's drawable, you know, it's, I'm not sure Bosha would be thrilled with it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> not, but that's you, not you being do draw it in but... the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, so that's, what... a, that's his opinion. Were, were, were there any other characters in, in Penrick that kind of uh, started to run away with you? Or I'm not sure. Every once in a while, a character comes popping out of the, you know, popping out of the plot, you know, popping out of the box. You need you need a character to do this thing. So you come up with this character to do this thing. And all of a sudden they have backstory, they have opinions, they have <laughs> life and, you know, and blood. And the one that kind of popped up in Prisoner of Lydnos was Nikki's half-brother, uh, the bridge builder, um, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Rodoa, uh, Icos Rodoa, it turns out mm-hmm. quite unexpectedly mid-book to both the characters and to me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and he's, he's of and this type, you know, Roman, Roman, Roman architect builder type, you know, which I'd also been reading up a lot about. So he, that he mm-hmm. sopped up all that. Yeah, you know, all that backstory and it became him very quickly. Um, <laughs> he didn't have a large part, but uh, but he was a character. Yeah, he's uh, another interesting uh, uh, momentary character is Kirato, the uh, the sorcerer that uh, Penric faces at the end of um, Penric's mission. Right. Yes, another temple sorcerer with a, with a little different style because. <laughs> Every demon is different on account of having been in different people and having different, you know, track records. Uh, you know, whether they've been in one person or six makes a difference in the power and knowledge base of the demon. Um, mm-hmm. you know, every temple sorcerer is different. They're not, you know, they're not stamped out of a mold. So, so I get as a writer, I get a lot of opportunity to play with uh, the various possibilities in this very <laughs> profian <laughs> system. Well, we were talking earlier about um, uh, that you've um, taken up anime as a as a hobby, um, mm-hmm. and uh, did, did, and we were also talking about the, the tropes in, in anime are different than than that in uh, uh, historical Western literature. Um, uh-huh. Do you do you find do you find that popping up in in this series that you're using uh, a slightly different set of of expectations in this series than than you have previously? I'm not sure. Um, I've been watching anime for you know, many years. I first actually mm-hmm. first encountered it back in um, film rooms in at science fiction conventions in the mid '80s when there were no translations, and the fan would be standing up there, you know, trying to do simultaneous translation <laughs> you know, and explain this yeah. thing to a bewildered but interested mm-hmm. audience of fans who'd never seen it. And then in the 90s, you begin to trickle into the video cassette rental stores. Remember those? Um, mm-hmm. But there would only be like, you know, the second volume of some series. You know, it was very uh, <laughs> frustrating to try to you know, follow any stories. But it was clear that it was you know, a different kind of thing. I was working off a different set of mythologies with which I was less familiar, uh, different ideas of the supernatural and how it worked. Uh, the whole mm-hmm. reincarnation shtick and all this memory stuff that you know goes with it, memory and amnesia uh, goes right with the uh, reincarnation tropes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a whole bunch of cultural assumptions, and then, and then we get you know further into it, you begin to see oh this is this is Taoism and this is Buddhism and this is Shinto and this is you know this other piece of Asian mythology that you know and they're all kind of brought together to play with each other uh, or play off mm-hmm. each other uh, in modern stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, I better find out more about Buddhism or you won't understand what the heck is going on in this story. <laughs> oh, okay. The Buddhists deal with the corpses and the Shinto don't because they regard corpses as ritually unclean. So they do the wedding. It's all right. That's how that's divided up. Too. So you learn these things. <laughs> Kind of by immersion, if you watch it. But anyway, that way, in the uh, yeah. early 2000s, I got Netflix and I got way more access and became gradually more familiar. Which ones do you like? Mm. There was a very long list. Um, <laughs> at the top is always the Shishi, which is a really hard to describe one about a character named Ginkgo. Um, he is an itinerant medicine seller with supernatural abilities, and he studies a subject called Mushi, which are supernatural sub-life entities that appear and you know, work. Uh, they're kind of like nature spirits, and they create problems sometimes, but they're not necessarily evil, and they don't necessarily need to be killed, but they need to be understood. Hmm. And so he's kind of a Mushi, mushi naturalist, uh, as he moves around through these stories, each story is uh, very few of them. All, almost all the chapters or are, are episodes are a single independent story, and Giko mm-hmm. moves through the world, and you move with him. Um, it's a great character, so that's a good one. And then there's thousands of others. Uh, well, probably not thousands, hundreds, maybe by now. <laughs> um, there's uh, a bunch of stuff from Crunchyroll. 
uh, which is an anime streaming service that I signed up for a few years ago. I've gotten my money's worth out of that subscription. Um, and there's everything from you know, adventure stories, way too many junior high school stories, uh, superhero <laughs> stuff, uh, uh, Japanese historical, Japanese historical fantasy, um, lots of that. Uh, I got my fill of giant fighting robots way early on. I don't bother with those anymore. <laughs> the whole genre called mecha. Um, you just give those a skip, and I skip all the horror, and I skip all the uh, most of the most of the samurai stuff. Not all of it, um, mm-hmm. but that still leaves a lot. Yeah, a lot of. Yeah, you know, yokai are the Japanese supernatural little creatures that can take all kinds of forms. So anything with yokai in it, yeah, I would look at. Another one that came by recently, the particular interest is something called Thunderbolt Fantasy, which hmm. was is um, Taiwanese traditional puppetry, uh, hmm. for which a, they did a collaboration with Japanese anime people, and the anime people wrote the script and did voicing. Evidently, when the puppetry is done as stage puppetry, you know, one narrator does all the voices. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's uh, just astonishing costuming and puppetry work and whatnot. Uh, so they've, they've made several of those, and they're grand fun. They refer to them as Taiwanese murder muppets because there's a lot of beheading in stage blood. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, that sounds yeah. like fun. Yeah. And there are many more. There, we could go on yeah. for hours, but perhaps shouldn't. Maybe I have a question for Tony and maybe uh, you as well. And why and how did uh, it come about that we brought these novellas that Lois had been, you know, experimenting with and publishing and e-publishing and, and such? In uh, apart from the fact that you know we just wanted to have another Bujold book uh, out, of course. Um, what was the uh, what was the process of bringing these together and and the story behind it happening? It really started from you know the fans. Uh, you know, I brought these things out as novellas, which I thought would be like a la carte. and you know existing off in their own little e bubble, and you know, being my retirement project. And like within 15 minutes, people are saying, when are we going to be able to get it on paper? It's like, you still read on paper? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, then uh, Subterranean Press, uh, which does limited edition deluxe little hardcovers, uh, picked them up. And they were successful enough that they've continued to pick up each novella as a separate uh, separate collectible thing. But that's pricey, you know, through, and you get your money's worth. I mean, they're good little books, lovely little books, but they're, mm-hmm. they're not a mass market, you know, reach everybody edition. They're like 2,000 copies and that's it. Um, so, you know, so that was cool, but uh, but it wasn't what the fans who wanted it on paper were talking about. Um, so, so, yeah, so I was like, you know, okay, let's think about this, but I knew I wanted to make them be collections, like going back to Borders of Infinity, that first mm-hmm. uh, Miles yep. collection for Bain with the three novellas. Uh, talking a little about the history of that, I had written the first novella, The Borders of Infinity, at Betsy Mitchell, then Bain editor's invitation. She mm-hmm. was putting together a, a series of these things, uh, and it came out with... Uh, another novella by Orson Scott Card and one by David Drake, which was great for introducing me to like, you know, more readers at that <laughs> time in the in the late eighties. Um but that was the first novella I'd ever written and I really liked the length. So I, you know, was was happy to revisit that idea. And it seemed like three is about the right number. Uh it makes it makes your hundred thousand words and some change that, you know, is what people expect novels, you know, books to be. Um, uh, used to be 80,000, but, you know, inflation. Um, <laughs> and I I knew I wanted them to be, you know, in order. I wasn't exactly writing them in order. Um, and then we had to wait for the uh, subterranean press exclusive uh, period to run out, which was short, you know, by publishing standards. But, uh, so, you know, so it wasn't something I could do right away. And meanwhile, I was writing more. And so the, the idea of the collection of two 
sets of three, yeah, kind of came into focus about the time I was working on the fourth one or so. So, so I wanted to wait, do them as a pair, and do them in an organized fashion. Uh, <laughs> so that's how you got them uh, when you did. <laughs> well, doing it that way too, let us have the uh, the same cover artist. Uh, we could give him both books at the same time, and um, mm-hmm. he could really get a feel for the character as well. So, um, so that that yeah, was, that was yeah. a, a nice thing for us to do. We get the okay. the great Dan Dos Santos to do those covers. And, yeah, uh, it's a new artist for me. I've gotten a lot of compliments and good remarks about those covers. People are, are really liking them. So, but they look classy. Well, they, well, well, Dan, Dan is winning awards for them as well. I should mention. So, um, so yeah, he's, he's got nice uh, one of them was, too. was nominated. I don't know what happened after the nomination, whether it won or whether it's gone by already. But uh, I was glad to see that. I hope he felt validated. Yep. <laughs> Well, Dan, like 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 Lois, Dan gets his influences from a lot of different places, and and is is mm-hmm. always uh, is always absorbing new new uh, new ideas and, and and new new forms and and experimenting with his own works. So it's a it's it's a good match um, mm-hmm. uh, for these guys. So yeah, they were they were very well, intelligent the... covers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's uh, maybe Tony. You can describe the the Penrix travel cover with the uh, the because the demon is very hard to represent visually. Dan figured a way to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah it is. Uh, and, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, we uh, we 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 just did a uh, version of the uh, the Bain Traveling Road Show where we got to do all artists. Um, Dan was actually not part of it, um, but uh, uh, that's up at our Facebook page. Um, and uh, for those who haven't been to a convention or seen it, it's uh, it's a it's a PowerPoint presentation where we show the beautiful artwork, um, and then we show the beautiful cover, and uh, we talk about the books and we talk about um, the art and how it's created and so on. And usually at a given convention, you don't, you don't have a lot of artists at them, or the artists are way too busy, like DragonCon, to uh, to participate in much programming. Um, mm-hmm. But because we're doing them virtually, we got to have this all-star cast of uh, Bane artists. Um, so we had uh, about ten different guys um, and ladies uh, commenting uh, commenting on their art and and, and the art um, that we had. <coughs> um, and uh, and several of these guys um, are at the stage in their career where they're also teaching. Um, Todd Lockwood is teaching, and Sam Kennedy has just started teaching, and David Mattingly's been teaching for a while. Um, so they can really, you know, they they can talk very very enthusiastically and articulately about um, about the work. Um, and I don't remember where I was going with this, but um, <laughs> oh, I know where I was Hopefully going with this. Hopefully, reaction to set those covers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's fun. It is it is fun to hand these guys uh, covers that are not easy um, because they are up to the challenge um, and mm-hmm. they enjoy challenges. Um, they they rise to the challenge. Um, if and so so this was this was one that wasn't easy, uh, but I but I but I think that uh, Dan really got the uh, you know got, got a good mm-hmm. grip on uh, being able to because Desdemona is important. She needs to be on the cover. But uh-huh. how do you represent <laughs> these, you know, uh, these these women um, and the lioness and the uh, and the horse? Um, the yeah. lioness and the horse didn't make it into this cover, but they, they were on the previous cover. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, they are an integral part of of Penrick, um, so they have uh-huh. to be on the cover. But but how, but how do you you know how do you take this and and make this literal? Um, uh-huh. And uh, well, the answer is you can't. Uh, but you can make it visual. So uh, uh-huh. um, and and then so in this case we have we have portraits of the of the women who have been um, hosts for the demon, um, and each of you know, each of the women has their own um, uh, their own feel in this. So it's not just a portrait mm-hmm. of Penrick; it's also a portrait of everybody else, and also a beautiful um, uh, sea scene as well. So, uh, as, yeah, as many yeah. as will fit onto that freeze, you know, because if you put all ten, <laughs> yeah. it would be too crowded, and you know, or this would be complaining <laughs> about, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an interesting um, way of uh, putting it all together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that one. 
I will so, uh, blue, so yeah, the seascape and everything looks <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, and yeah, Henrik in his thing. book, yeah, looking very bookish, uh, as he should. Well, Tony also had it framed up, um, which is interesting, and the raised tie. It's just a, a beautiful. Tony is the artistic director here as well as the boss. Um, and she had it. Um, I, I really like the packaging of the 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 beauty of the the bookiness of the cover. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, if you've got great art, you know, covering it up with a lot of lettering is is wasting your you know wasting your money and talent. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, put your lettering on the outside, and you can see the art, and yeah, life is good. Yeah. Well, we put your name pretty big, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> now that too. <laughs> Well, you're not going to waste a good name either, so. <laughs> yeah. That works. That works. Yeah, I was, I was well, what, pleased uh, with the Penix Travel cover. Well, I, I think it's going to be fun if we get, if we do get to do a third volume to see what Dan comes up with for, for the next one. So, fingers mm-hmm. crossed. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got two out of three, but I don't know what the third one is because it's just, I just finished it last week. <laughs> uh, taking somewhere no, no off pressure. and then we'll no, see. No, no pressure, yeah. no pressure. <laughs> There's lots of things I could do, or you know, I could go off in another direction. For example, I did uh, Knife Children earlier this last year, and mm-hmm. the subterranean yeah. press just for that, which is a a kind of codicil story to the Sharing Knife tetralogy. That is, yeah. You know, I had a bit of notion in my head for a very long time, and you know, it was finally time. You know, the characters presented yeah. themselves, and the opening yeah. scene, and you know, actually the opening scene had been in my head for a very long time, but I didn't know where it went right after that. You know, it always began with with Barr shaving off his loosely and beard, his winter beard, and you know, <laughs> preparing to you know, go find Lily and finding the place burned down. Um, yeah. So, but then it was, you know, what I ended up with was the uh... story of my first sessions. One of the fun details that in Penrick's travels is the way that Penrick shaves, <laughs> which... Comes up, <laughs> yeah. If you if you've got a demon, you know, there's all kinds of little domestic tricks you could do with a bit of chaos <laughs> magic if it's you know properly controlled. Um, and I, yeah, I, I haven't very thought jealous. through all of them, but yeah, there's yeah. So you just wipe it off. It's like depilatory without the depilatory, and then, and then there's you know, the insect control and uh, uh, lighting fires and. Desdemona points out in Penrick's very first tutorial back in Penrick's Demon, you know, all these things sound great, but the problem with them is that you also can't prove you didn't do them. (laughs) (laughs) So if a fire starts, is it you? You know, you're the sorcerer. You might have done. The sorcerers tend to be very discreet (laughs) about their magics because it's all invisible. Um, You know, we, we, alas, do not have, you know, people flinging fireballs at each other in great magical combats. It's all stealthy and biological and invisible and um, can pass completely unnoticed. Um, There's actually an aspect of that I've been thinking about uh, with Penrick's world and the invisible magic, but the fact that magic is real. Uh Magical uh, accusations can be disproven. Uh, hmm. Thinking of all the the Middle Ages in our in our world of all the witch hunts and whatnot, you know, in this world, you know, if someone is accused of magic, you can actually get somebody out there who can say yes or no, and if it's no, ah, uh, ah. then you know, it's like they're off the hook. But they didn't, you know, they didn't do it. Uh, huh. I think that sounds like a Penrick uh, a Penrick legal drama. That would be a great novella. Uh, it would. <laughs> You know, I have a box with not enough ideas in it. It's been rattling around for a while of, you know, of those notions, you know, the kind of thing that he would be sent out to check out. You know. And then, you know, that's the basic notion, but what are the complications that would make the story? Mm-hmm. Like the setting, mm-hmm. I'd prefer to get too far away from it. I'd like to do with more with his relationship with the Princess Archdivine back in Martinsbridge. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Fun to explore a little more. Um, so, yeah. Who knows? Hmm. Well, we will look forward to reading it when 
if and when it comes comes around, and if it's not that one, then we'll look forward to reading the next one that comes. So there will be something else. Yeah, I've learned to be very careful what I mention because people will take it and yeah. run with it, and you know, I think uh, it was a promise when it was just me gabbing. Yeah. <laughs> and future projects. Well, there's um, there's so much else that uh, we could we could talk about. Um, I uh, I did want briefly to just ask you um, because you you talk about it and it really was intriguing in that Clark's World interview was the purpose of fiction as opposed to nonfiction. You just like touched on it a little bit, and I before we go, I'd really like you to to tease us a little with with your thoughts on that, if you don't mind, Lois. Well. Um... Fiction, well, we do learn about the world through fiction, but we're, it's all filtered through the mind of the fiction writer. You, know, you only get what they understood, uh, given back to you. Things mm-hmm. you want to know about the world, you read nonfiction, uh, which is also filtered, you realize, after a while, through the <laughs> brain of a particular writer and you know, edited you know, down. Uh, you have to learn to take that with a grain of salt, too. So maybe fiction reading teaches you how to read nonfiction more closely. But, yeah, I think fiction is doing a different job. Um, you know, fiction that informs is fun, but I think what fiction really does is play with the emotions. That's what art does generally. You know, it's not something that, you know, has an obvious biological necessity, you know, evolved thing, um, uh, like vision or sight or any of the other things that human brains do. You know, it's not at all clear how this becomes, you know, something that helps people survive, <laughs> survive and reproduce. Um, so it's like, why art? Why do we even have the capacity for art? It's the, at the moment, a question without an answer, but it seems to be, you know, a very human thing. And art, I think, is ultimately about emotions. Uh, if it's about information, it would be nonfiction. It would be uh, manuals. You know. um, hmm. And that's that's not what art is doing. It is doing something else. Uh, and I think the, uh, the artist or writer who can evoke emotions in people is the one who's going to be getting the response. Uh, however, you know, however, the many ways you can do that... Uh, so, yeah, emotion doesn't get good press, but I think that's what it's doing underneath. That's a lot of food for thought there. Yeah. Well, um, we hope that you continue evoking emotions, and and we certainly invoke a lot of emotions uh, at a vast spectrum in Penrick's Travels, which is out now, Booksellers Everywhere, by Lois McMaster Bujold. Um Lois and Tony, thank you so much for uh, for for talking with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tony. That was part two of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold and Tony Weiskopf discussing Penrick's travels. Part one is available on last week's podcast. Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Salarian League. For hundreds of years they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising Courage. Honor Harrington has won the Star Kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League. And hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. August 1922, Post-Diaspora. SLNS, Quebec. Cachalot System. You can't be serious! 
The woman on Vincent Capriotti's comm display was platinum-haired and dark-skinned. It was a striking combination, and she was so photogenic, he suspected she'd been the recipient of quite a lot of biosculpt. Politicians, as a rule, found physical attractiveness a valuable asset. Far more valuable, in fact, in Capriotti's opinion, than simple competence. On the other hand, Cashelot System President Miriam Yonka had amply demonstrated her own competence over a 40-t-year political career. And at the moment, the fury blazing in her brown eyes honed her attractiveness in much the same way lightning honed a thunderstorm's, or a hurricane's, perhaps. I'm afraid I'm quite serious, Madam President, he said in reply, then sat back to wait out the six-minute communications lag. At the moment, TF-783 was almost 56 million kilometers from the planet Orca, just over 10 light minutes inside the Cashelot system hyperlimit, closing with the planet at 18,119 kps and decelerating at a steady 300 g. Given that geometry, they would reach Orca orbit in another hour and 40 minutes, and their recon platforms had been swarming around the inner system for the last couple of hours. O&I had grudgingly admitted that stealth systems were another area in which the Mantis had somehow acquired a commanding lead, but nobody's stealth was good enough to hide warships, even completely shut down warships, from the horde of drones he'd sent speeding ahead of his ships. Which means there's absolutely no reason I can't carry out Buccaneer, damn it, he thought grimly. The odds are we'll be the first task force to execute it too, which means I'm the one going down in the frigging history books. I don't think I'm going to like that. At least it also meant there'd be no need or any possible excuse for Parthian. There'd be ample time for an orderly evacuation, and thank God for it. He'd waited until he was positive that would be the case, and until the comm lag was at least semi-manageable, before contacting Yanka's office and telling her why he was here. Her response had been pretty much what he'd anticipated. You have no conceivable justification for this, she snapped now from her display. It's a blatantly illegal action against an independent and neutral star system. It violates at least a half dozen interstellar treaties, treaties the Solarian League both negotiated and guaranteed, and every conceivable canon of interstellar law. All of which was absolutely true, and had nothing at all to do with his orders, Capriotti thought. I'm very sorry you feel that way, Madam President he said, and speaking as an individual and not as an officer of the Solarian League Navy, I understand why you do. I deeply regret the orders I've been given, but I have no option but to carry them out, and I intend to do so. At the same time, my orders emphasize the vital importance of minimizing any possible avoidable loss of life. Which was also true, as long as Parthion wasn't on the table. That's why I'm speaking to you now, to inform you that you have 72 hours to complete your evacuation of the infrastructure in question. He waited for his words to reach her, and saw her expression when they did. If she could have reached him in that moment, she would have ripped out his throat with her bare hands, he thought. This system has maintained cordial and cooperative relations with the Solarian League since the year the League was created, she told him flatly. We have never in all those centuries been anything but your star nation's friendly neighbor, and we certainly aren't participants in any aggression against the League. We're not Solarians, we aren't Mentacorans, and we've been scrupulously neutral. We don't even have a navy, only a system police force. What you propose is not only blatantly illegal, but an atrocity carried out against the life's blood of my star system. She had an excellent point, he reflected. Not that he intended to admit that Cachalot's lack of a navy was one of the main reasons he'd been sent here. Madam President, I'm prepared to grant that you haven't been military participants in the so-called Grand Alliance's aggression against the Solarian League, he said. He knew he was speaking for the record, that this entire comm exchange was probably going to wind up on the public boards throughout the League, and he forced himself to sound calm, measured, and above all, reasonable. It was hard when what he actually felt was bitter shame. But he was a senior officer of the SLN, and he had his orders. Even though you may not have aided the Manticorans and their allies militarily, however, he continued, you've certainly aided and abetted them in other ways. 
As your government is well aware, Manticore began its campaign against the Solarian League by way of its blatantly illegal interference with freedom of astrogation and the Solarian economy. In effect, Manticore has weaponized interstellar commerce and directed it against the Solarian League because of my government's refusal to simply stand aside and enable its raw, unbridled imperialism through our passivity. And, Madam President, your star system has transferred virtually the entirety of its own trade to Manticore and the other star nations, who, by their own declaration, are now actively at war with the League. That's hardly the action of an even-handed neutral, and my government has no option but to consider active collaboration with outlaw regimes which have killed hundreds of thousands of Solarian military personnel and citizens an act of aggression. He met Yanka's eyes steadily, even though both of them knew just how tenuous the connection between reality and what he'd just said truly was. The Solarian League takes no pleasure in the destruction of property, and my government is well aware of the economic hardship this will create for the people of your star nation. He went on in a tone of implacable regret, filling the transmission lag with the rest of the talking points with which the Navy and foreign affairs had seen fit to provide him. If he gave her the opportunity to respond, she'd probably point out that Manticore's version of commerce warfare meant the Star Empire and its allies were the only people with whom Cachalot could trade at the moment and his lords and masters could never have that as part of the official record now, could they? However, it's clear Manticore has embraced an imperialism which is as much economic as territorial. Not content with the commanding position it already enjoyed, it's now set out to secure dictatorial control of the entire inhabited galaxy's economic life. The Solarian League cannot and will not allow any star nation to acquire that sort of power, of control and coercion over its star systems and their citizens. And since it's evident that raw aggression and economic domination are the only languages the star empire understands, the League has no option but to respond to it in its own terms. Much as I may regret the mission which has brought me to your star system, your complicity in Manticore's assault upon the Solarian League has left my government with no other alternative. Again, I inform you that you have 72 hours in which to organize an evacuation of your orbital infrastructure. Obviously, I must also insist on the surrender of the armed units of your system patrol. Vice Admiral Angelica Helland, my chief of staff, will be in contact with the system patrol's commanding officer to arrange that surrender in as peaceful and orderly a fashion as possible. I'm sure I've presented you with a great many unpleasant decisions and actions, Again, I regret the necessity of doing so, but I will leave you to deal with them. I will contact you again when my flagship enters Orca orbit. Capriotti, clear. He pressed the stud to kill his calm and swiveled his chair to face Commodore Anthony, his staff communications officer. Until I contact her again, I'm unavailable, Roger, he said. Anthony's eyebrows rose ever so slightly and it was obvious from his expression that he didn't look forward to fending off Yonka's inevitable fiery demands to speak to Capriotti, but the Commodore only nodded. Capriotti returned the nod, then turned back to the master plot as Quebec and the rest of the task force decelerated toward Orca. He watched the moving icons and wondered how much of his unavailability stemmed from the PR requirements and psychological warfare aspects of Buccaneer, and how much of it stemmed from shame. He remembered his words to Captain Timberlake in their first discussion of the Ops Order, and they were bitter on his tongue. This wasn't the reason he'd joined the Navy, but if he had to do it, then he'd damned well do it. We're ready, sir, Liang Tao Rutger said quietly. Capriotti nodded without speaking. He stood with his hands clasped behind him, gazing into the flag bridge plot. It had been reconfigured for visual display, showing him a needle-sharp vista of the planet Orca and the massive orbital infrastructure about it. Cashelot had been settled for a long time, but it wasn't the best real estate in the known galaxy. Despite the relative dimness of the system primary, whose luminosity was less than 14% that of Sol, Orca's close orbit, the planetary year was less than three T-months long, produced a mean temperature significantly higher than old Terra's. 
Its tropical zone was virtually uninhabited, and its axial inclination was only nine degrees, which meant it had minimal seasonal variation even outside the all but unendurable tropics. There were, however, almost five billion human beings in its temperate zones, and another three billion in its orbital habitats. That was a lot of people to turn into implacable haters, he thought. At least the Cachalotians had opted for a sharper segregation between their industrial platforms and their habitats than happened in most star systems. That had probably started initially because so many of them had opted for the habitat's controlled climates in preference to the planets from the very beginning. That meant the inhabited neighborhood had grown up even before its industrial base really developed, and separating them had protected their orbital population from the sorts of industrial accidents that could have unfortunate consequences. It had to create commuting problems for a lot of their labor force, but they clearly thought it was worth it, and their building codes had officially enshrined the separation for several centuries now. Of course, they'd never seen an industrial accident like Buccaneer coming. They were still going to lose one orbital habitat, and the homes of over five million of their citizens anyway. There simply wasn't any way to demolish the Siesta 3 platform's industrial capability without taking out the entire habitat. Three more major habitats were going to take significant damage, but Rutgers' demolition crews were confident the housing sections would survive unhurt. Not so confident that Yanka or me was going to leave those people aboard when the charges go off. Capriotti snorted mentally. It's a lot easier to be confident about somebody else's homes he thought harshly. Even without minor considerations like that, destroying the platforms in Orca orbit without creating catastrophic debris strikes on both the planet and the remaining habitats was a non-trivial exercise in its own right. The snapper belt platforms, better than 50 light minutes from the primary, were a much simpler proposition. Snapper 644,000 inhabitants had simply been moved en masse to Orca's surface, and a dozen of Capriotti's destroyers would take out the belt's entire infrastructure with targeted missile launches. Closer to the planet, that was a non-starter, however, and he considered the battle cruisers positioned around the first of Rutgers' targets. Very well, Liang Tao, he sighed finally. Proceed. Yes, sir. Capriotti stayed where he was, watching the visual, as the battle cruisers brought up their impeller wedges. The three major platforms, two fabrication centers and one of Orca's six primary freight platforms, remained clearly visible from Quebec's more distant orbit. The activated wedges completely enclosed them on three sides, however, cutting off direct visual observation from the planetary surface or any of Orca's other near-planet habitats or space stations. Detonation in 15 seconds. Mark, Rutgers said clearly behind him. Fifteen. Ten, five, four, three, two, one. The nuclear charges detonated simultaneously in bursts of brilliance which hurt the eye. That had to be purely psychosomatic, Capriotti thought, even as he blinked against the brightness. The display automatically filtered their intensity more rapidly than mere organic nerves could respond to it after all. Maybe it was just that he knew what they must have looked like to the unshielded eye. Not even a nuclear blast could completely vaporize several billion tons of space station. That was why he'd placed his battle cruiser's impeller wedges to intercept any debris. They'd hold their stations until he was positive nothing could get through to Orca or any of the other platforms. Then they'd move on to the next targets on their list. He stood for another 15 seconds, gazing at the spot where the next best thing to two millennia of investment and the livelihoods of 1.7 million people had just been wiped from the cosmos. Then he drew a deep breath and looked over his shoulder at his staff. Keep me informed, especially about any debris fields, he said. I'll be in my quarters. Of course, sir, Vice Admiral Helland responded for the entire staff. He nodded to them and walked from the flag bridge in silence. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. 
and the brush of a god's wing to mend the bursitis of such long life and protect against the oppressor's wrong, the law's delay, the slings and arrows of such longbow life, plus thanks, praise, and gratitude for Tony Weiskopf and Lois McMaster Bujol, science fiction grandmaster and author of Penrick's Travels. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.